Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're continuing our study of Sigurd Rascher's Top Tones for the Saxophone and taking a look at the section on overtones, which is the acoustic phenomenon that makes the saxophone's upper register possible. <laughs> In fact, the reason that every wind instrument has the capacity for a so-called altissimo register is due to the existence of the overtone series. So just like the flute or clarinet, the saxophone can also produce a range of at least three and a half octaves. For many saxophonists, the study of the overtone series is the starting point for playing the high notes. But it is also extremely beneficial for developing your tone across the basic range. As Rasher points out, there is no better single exercise for the development of tone production and intonation than the playing of a few overtones each day. In the foreword to the overtone exercises, Rasher instructs readers to sing the fourth tone in a C major scale, then to sound that same note while fingering a low B flat. As he says, for best results, don't force the tone will come quite naturally. If you do try to force the harmonic to speak, you're likely to introduce a lot of tension into your playing. Incidentally, this is true not only for playing overtones, but for producing any note throughout the entire range. And this is where the strength of your tone imagination comes into play, because you're selecting with your ear a specific partial in the overtone series. The more you are able to vividly imagine the note before playing it, the more success you're going to have in actually producing that tone. Exactly how this happens is hard to say, Tone imagination seems to work at a subconscious level, where it organizes your physiology in such a way that everything is lined up just right to play the note you're aiming for. This may explain the vocal track tuning measured by an Australian research group, which we talked about in the video on voicing. In any case, our job is to just perform these exercises regularly, and whatever is happening at a subconscious level will take care of itself. Rasher stresses that accurate intonation is of extreme importance and recommends that every overtone within the normal range be compared to its usual fingering. As well as octaves. Eventually, you'll reach overtones that are beyond the normal range, and those should be compared with notes an octave and a perfect fifth lower. So beyond each overtone exercise that is written in the book, you can get pretty creative in the variations comparing it with different tuning notes, along with practicing both the tongue attack and airstream attack. Right here, I want to mention again the importance of not forcing the overtones to speak. Personally, I was stuck at the third or fourth overtone for several years because I was too tense and not supplying a free-flowing airstream. As tends to happen with things that are challenging, and since I wasn't experiencing much progress, I avoided practicing it, which only further perpetuated the cycle of failure and frustration with this exercise. So what you need to do is stay as relaxed as possible and focus on vividly imagining the overtone with your inner ear. Putting too much attention on the embouchure, throat, diaphragm, or other factor is likely to introduce a lot of tension and make these exercises practically unplayable. If you're struggling to play the overtone exercises, there's another text worth mentioning here that many saxophonists feel is a useful supplement to top tones, and that is Donald Sinta's voicing, an approach to the saxophone's third register. 
You'll notice in top tones that the overtone exercises do not extend beyond the low D fingering. I imagine this is the case because intonation is a key aspect of the exercise, and because intonation of the overtone series gets progressively more distorted as the tube gets shorter. Donald Sinta's book goes beyond overtones of low D, and many players find it extremely beneficial to study the overtones of these fingerings as well. Even if they may be less in tune, I think the benefit comes from learning how to play the higher partials of these fingerings because they closely approximate what it feels like to play in the saxophone's upper register. Around the time I was finally starting to make some progress with the overtone exercises in top tones, my low C key post popped off, and I lost the low C and low E flat key cups. For about a month, I could not play anything lower than an E flat, which meant the only overtones I could practice were off of E flat and higher. When I finally got the horn fixed, the overtones of the long fingerings, or low B flat to low D, were easier than they had ever been before. The takeaway message from this is, if you're really struggling to play the overtone studies in top tones, try playing a few overtones on the short fingerings each day as well. In the long run, this will help you to move around the higher partials of the long fingerings, which can be very challenging, even if just for psychological reasons. One last, more humorous point. The study of the overtone series is not always very pretty, and you'll find yourself making some rather cacophonous sounds. At that point, welcome to saxophone multiphonics. <laughs> Remember that your goal is not to play these exercises perfectly every time, but to gradually perfect them. And just like the material in the previous videos, you don't have to practice it for hours every day, but it does have to be every day. In part four, we'll finally get into the top tones themselves and look at how you can start incorporating them into your playing so they are just as easy to use as the notes of the so-called normal range. Until then, keep doing the breathing calisthenics, and I'll see you next time.